you when you when you see technical difficulties like that it makes you so thankful for your paper bible <laughs> see if i was on a, if i was on a you know some kind of a pad i'd be shaking right now but uh, <laughs> No, 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 I got the paper Bible um, with the paper notes on the other side. So back just before we uh, stand to read the text together uh, this morning, what uh, Dale was sharing uh, with us from the Gideons just a couple of weeks ago in our Tuesday morning uh, prayer meeting, we uh, generally it's Pastor Don who uh, keeps us in touch with what's going on in a variety of nations around the world as we share prayer requests. And and one of those prayer requests a couple of weeks ago uh, related to the fact that in the nation of Somalia, um, you would get caught with a Bible, it would cost you your life. You just think about that for a moment. So you're in a completely Muslim nation where they control the whole education system. And they have everything in their control. They have absolutely everything in their control. And they still fear a written copy of the Bible so much that they make it a capital crime. Do the same thing in North Korea. They control everything, the government does. They control everything, university system, school system, everything. And still make it a capital crime for somebody to be caught with a copy of the word of God. And we just spoke briefly about the fact that isn't it interesting that sometimes the enemies of God's word take his word more seriously than the children of God take it in its power and influence. It's striking to me to, to just be reminded of how seriously the enemies of the word of God take the ability to do what we're about to do right now. So if you stand together, we'll read Mark chapter 1, verses 35 to 38. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, that is Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do ask that you would give ear to your people. And that you would enable us, as your people, to give ear to you, to incline our eyes and ears to the words that you have spoken to us through your prophets, through your apostles. You have told us about the nature of reality, sometimes in parables, what the psalmist calls dark sayings, to the end that you would enable us to know your way and know your will 
know the path of salvation and know the way of forgiveness and know that all things do, as we sang together this morning, all things do by your providence, by your wisdom, work together for good in the lives of those who are called of you, who are called according to your purpose, who love you. And so, Father, it is our prayer that we would learn these things and that we would, as the psalmist says, be enabled to pass them on from generation to generation. Lord, we pray for those who will be teaching in our Sunday school program in the coming hour, uh, that you would enable those teachers to craft your words to the students in such a way that they confront you that they take you to heart through your word and that they in turn will eventually pass those words on to their children and on it goes. And it's come down to us generation after generation after generation in ways as the psalmist is describing here. But Lord, we do live we find ourselves in a stubborn and rebellious generation. And we pray that you would sustain us in it, uh, that you would enable us to hold fast to your wisdom and your way where we find ourselves, whether it be because for many of your people, war has gripped the land, there's economic instability, there's relational turmoil, there's financial setbacks, on all these things, we ask that you would come and meet us by means of your word and give us the wisdom to stand in you and to hold fast to you. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. mentioned it before, these t-shirts that you'll uh, see with some regularity, WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Now, unfortunately, if you're not fairly well acquainted with the New Testament, The question that you could ask yourself, what would Jesus do, is a relatively useless question. Because unless you have some idea of things like what Jesus did do, as you find it in the New Testament, all you can really do is the culturally sort of popular and uh, default thing that we do with a lot of things. Uh, change what would Jesus do into something like this. What would I like to think Jesus would do? What would I like to imagine Jesus would do, um, which is uh, simply a, a, a matter of uh, fantasy. Uh, see, one, one of the reasons for studying something like the Gospel of Mark is that what you find there is not what Jesus would do, but what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? And in our little text for this morning, uh, verse 35, uh, well, as relation to prayer, here's something that Jesus did. 
Rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he, he prayed. So the previous day, you remember, a couple of paragraphs ago, had been um, a Saturday, Sabbath day. And Jesus had gone to the synagogue in the morning, and he had made quite a sensation there by casting the demon out of a man who had confronted him. And then he had gone home from that Sabbath service to find Peter's mother-in-law sick, and he had healed her. And then that evening, as we noted last week, the village came out of Capernaum to look into this ability that Jesus has to heal and cast out demons. And it was really quite a day. In fact, it was such a day that the first thing on Sunday morning after sunrise is that all kinds of people are showing up at Peter's house for another visit with Jesus. But what we're told is they're too late. They're too late. Uh, Jesus is already gone. What he had done was rise very early in the morning while it was still dark. And he had departed out to a desolate place. And he was praying there. That's what Jesus did, the kind of thing he did. Now, later in the gospel, in all kinds of places, through the gospel, even of Mark, and this is a much smaller section of Mark, and a lot more active teaching of Jesus in Matthew and in Luke than you find in Mark, but there's still plenty of active teaching of Jesus um, uh, in Mark. Is we go to Mark 14, 38, where Jesus gives us this recommendation about our prayer. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. For indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now you'd have to turn that into what did Jesus do? teach we ought to do. Now that becomes kind of a busy acronym, uh, W-D-J-T-W-O-T-D. Uh, not, not quite as catchy, and the, and the print on the t-shirt has to get smaller and smaller to, to fit it uh, all the way across. But that's what you have. That's what you have there in Mark 14.38. What did Jesus teach we ought to do? Watch out and pray in order that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What would Jesus do? Well, as disciples, the only way you can begin to answer that question is to know our our two questions. Well, what did he actually do? And what did he tell us that we ought to do? Well, that's the kind of thing that we'll take a look at this morning from Mark 1, 35 to 38, with this, in this case, in this text, especially the emphasis on what did Jesus do? What were Jesus priorities. Uh, that's important information for disciples to have and for disciples to consider. Uh, state our thesis for this morning this way. Our priorities ought to be shaped by the priorities of Jesus. Um, now, there's three priorities of Jesus mentioned here, two mentioned positively and one in the middle mentioned negatively. So first of all, note this, Jesus gave priority to prayer. Pretty obvious that he did. Verse 35, 
Rising early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Rodney Decker makes mention of the fact that that's one of those uh, little phrases that's a kind of a strange phrase in the, in the Greek text. You've got to fill quite a bit in. It's not smooth. Uh, in, in fact, the, the thrust of it, if you were just uh, translating it woodenly, would be early morning, at night, very. <laughs> Jesus rising early morning, at night, very or exceedingly, in the early morning, when it was still, still dark. Um, uh, three, the three uh, verbs there, rising up, kind of going out, either from the town or from the house, and then going away from either the town or the house. So, rising up, Going out, going, going away, going away. Made me almost think of that old Fifth Dimension song from 1967. Up, up, and away. My beautiful balloon. Up, up, and away. Here it's up, out, and away. Up, out, and away. He goes before sunup in the morning. We find on the other side, at the other end of Mark's gospel, that Jesus didn't just pray first thing in the morning, however. Uh, we read this in Mark 14, 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Well, this is the night that Jesus was betrayed. We already know from John's version of the Last Supper that by the last supper is by the time the last supper is over and by the time the first person leaves the last supper which is Judas it's already dark outside mark tells us when judas leaves the supper it is night and so jesus prays first thing in the morning before the sun comes up and then you find him after the sun has gone down praying again in a garden in a very tense night, telling us that prayer is a really significant priority for the Lord Jesus. Uh, you see that written right on the face of this text. And as we've said, and he turns around and turns it right into um, a command to us. Mark 14, 38, watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. Watch out. Watch out for what? Well, that night, soldiers are coming, but, but, but it's a universal, look out. Look out. Constantly live in difficult times. Bro broadly speaking, uh, Mark 8, 14, here's another look out sort of warning from Jesus. And this one is, shows you how tricky our situation really is. He cautioned them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Leaven being a metaphor for a tendency to have your life infected by. Now, these categories don't line up perfectly, but, but it, 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 it would be broadly true to say that you could turn this into be careful of the temptations of the right and of the left. Pharisees would be very much temptations on the right. Temptation to become very proud of your conservatism, very proud of your religiosity in Jesus mind an extraordinarily deadly move the leaven of the Pharisees on the other hand the leaven of Herod is beware of the tendency to abandon everything to fit in smoothly with the empire within which you live in his case the Roman Empire 
which is what Herod did. Oh, Herod was Jewish. Herod even liked listening to John the Baptist. But Herod carried far more, far more for his position and his place in the Roman Empire than about anything else. And it absolutely controlled him, his desire to fit in. And Jesus says to us, make prayer a priority, and then you pray and pray, being careful of your situation. You have, you have things trying to trip you up from both sides. And all around us, we have people telling us, no, 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 no. All of the temptations are on one side. If you're conservative, they're all on the left. If you're a liberal, they're all on the right. Jesus says, no, they're constantly on the left and the right all the time. All the time, you look out for the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And another thing he taught us about prayer is that it's not easy to remain consistent at it. We looked at this text a couple of weeks ago, but Romans, or excuse me, Luke 18.1. Luke 18.1. He told them a parable to this effect, that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. The parable was about a, a, a widow woman who goes to a judge who could care less about her. And, and she asks him for things, and, and he ignores her at first. And then uh, the particular nature of this woman is that she's a good whiner. And so she turns herself into the whining widow woman and, and she whines and she whines and she whines until the judge is sick enough of the whining, Jesus says, that he caves in and gives her her way. And then Jesus says this, your father in heaven is nothing like that uncaring judge. But I want you to be exactly like that whining woman. I want you to pray and not lose heart. Here's how it reads in Luke 18, 7. May not God do judgment for his elect, those calling to him day and night. And then this last little line. And he suffers long upon them. What does that mean? Well, our various translations uh, lead you in different directions. The most helpful, I think, is the King James, which reads it pretty much like I just said it. That is, God is patiently waiting for you and I to become people who have prayer as such of a priority that we are those who pray and don't lose heart. And Jesus is so realistic about us that he closes off the parable by saying this. And when the Son of Man comes, will he find anybody doing that? Will he find anybody doing that? God is waiting for you and I to become people who pray and make prayer a priority. We pray and we don't lose heart. We watch and pray. This was the priority of Jesus. You see it right there in verse 35. When rising early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place to pray. Secondly, note this. Jesus gave no priority to popularity. Verse 36. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him. They said to him, 
Everyone is looking for you. Everyone is looking for you. What are you doing out here all by yourself, Jesus? Don't you know, back in Capernaum, they're all come. They are looking for you. Let me tell you, Jesus, yesterday was a big hit. That was a big hit. You should, they're, they're here first thing in the morning. Yesterday was a great day. You need to get back into town. This worked marvelously. I'll tell you, this, this exorcism healing thing, people like that. They like that. So let's get back into town and give them a little more of that. Now in Luke's parallel to this, which is what was read uh, this morning, a piece of it, Luke's parallel, parallel Luke chapter 4, um, Luke gives us a little bit more information. He gives us the last stop of Jesus before he got to Capernaum. And we referred to this last week. So Luke 4, verses 14 and 15. So here's the little summary statement just before he goes to Nazareth. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and a report about him went out throughout the surrounding country. And he taught in the synagogues, being glorified by all. So there you go. That's pretty encouraging. But then he gets to Nazareth. And he preaches a sermon from Isaiah 61 with illustrations from 2 Kings. And, and that didn't go as well. Um, here's how uh, the service at that synagogue ends, Luke 4, 29 to 31. And they rose up and they drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away, and he went down to Capernaum. So that's just where they've been. So Peter just had the experience where, like, okay, I uh, made notes. No more preaching from Isaiah. No more illustrations from 2 Kings. That's a loser. Uh, that could just about get you killed. We're going to get nowhere if we focus on Isaiah and 2 Kings. However, I mean, this, this exorcism healing thing, the people love it. The people love it. That's what he's saying to Jesus. Everybody's seeking you. It was a hit. We got to get back there. Preacher Jack Hayford also wrote songs early 60s and 70s when he was a younger man. And one of, one of the more popular songs that he wrote uh, goes to this issue pretty nicely. Some of you are old enough, you'll remember it. He had these lines. Nobody lauded him, nobody sang, no crowds applauded him, no bells rang. When he went to the desert to fast and pray, nobody, nobody, nobody cared. But oh, how the thousands came when the bread was multiplied. And oh, how the hosannas rang on the king's triumphant ride. And as long as the miracles flowed like wine, they called him wonderful. We all think like Peter, right? We all want to be popular. You want to be a part of something that's popular. Almost 50 years ago, that's where a guy by the name of Bill Heibel started interviewing folks in suburban Chicago. Like, why don't you go to church? What would it take for you, for you to go to church? If, what would have to be happening at church for you to go there? If the music was a lot better, if they put on skits, if they, yes. So they did all that. Huge success. Huge success. Thousands and thousands of people. He referred to it as unchurched Harry and Mary. Now, they mostly came from other churches, but still. 
Um, uh, they were, uh, it, it was, it was a huge success. But sometimes it's just step back and remember the obvious for just a moment. You know what? Jesus was not an American. Now, he loves Americans. But he wasn't American. And as we'll see in our text, he doesn't think like that. He does not think like that at all. So when he is told, everyone is looking for you. Everyone is looking for you. Here's his response. Verse 38. And he said to them, let us go to the next towns and we shall preach there. Right, if you're Peter, what are you thinking? We tried the preaching thing at Nazareth. I'll tell you, that was not a big winner. You just about got killed there. Why would Jesus say that? Well, because he doesn't, he doesn't have popularity in that sense as a priority. He just doesn't. He just doesn't. Uh, but rather, as we'll see in our, this third and final priority, note this. Jesus gave priority to preaching. He said to them, let's go on to the next towns. And now there's two purpose clauses in a row. Uh, in Mark, they're sort of indistinguishable, sort of indistinguishable. That you, can, you can sort of possibly come to the conclusion that the second one is a broader, bigger purpose than the first. But in Mark, it's, it's not obvious. But again, in Luke's parallel passage, it's obvious so that we can know without any doubt that the second one is a much bigger, broader statement than the first one. So here it is, verse 38 again. Let's go on to the next towns, and here's the purpose clause. In order that, or that, I may preach there also, that's the first purpose, here's the second one. For that is why I came out. Now in the second one, what you can't tell is, that is, is that why I came out of Capernaum to go on to the next place or is that why I came out of heaven to earth? Can't tell in Mark. But in Luke, you can tell uh, that it's the second thing and not the first thing. And that's uh, why Eric read what he read this morning, uh, Luke 4, and in the middle of what he read was verse 43. And Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. And now this great big purpose statement. For I was sent for this purpose. That is, I was sent from my Father in heaven to announce the word of God to people. I don't know whether you, you know, most of us probably in the room like this believe in the word of God, but not all of us. Not all of us. But whether you believe it or whether you don't believe it, at least see this and acknowledge this. It makes a big difference whether there is such a thing as word of God in the world. If there is such a thing as word of God in the world, it is a monumentally important word that defines everything, that controls everything, that determines everything. Because if God has spoken, see, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. He gets to say the way it is. It's not up for debate, not waiting for input, not taking polls like we do about everything. We decide what we believe largely on what most people think, what most people like to think. If there's somebody like God, he's nothing like that. 
and word of God works nothing like that. And Jesus assumes that there is word of God in the world and it's his purpose to announce it. And so he does. And it's central to his life and ministry that he says what God has says. He tells us who God is, what he's like, how you can be forgiven, how you might have a relationship with him. Uh, we can't uh, go into all the kinds of things that he says, but that's the kinds of things uh, that, that he says. There's word of God in the world. There's, there's things that are simply fixed truths. And we're living in a time where the whole culture is moving away from the influence of biblical word of God in the world rapidly, comprehensively, in ways that are, are shocking, I think, to... Um, Christian people to, to the culture at large. Uh, uh, for some, it's shockingly good news. For others, it's shockingly bad news. But we're, we're doing it. We're, we're moving very, very, very quickly and on, on, on the grand scale. Uh, uh, so just this last week, right? Some of you probably saw this. Uh, you know, they used to, before the parade at Disney World, I've been to Disney World uh, years ago with with, with my children. Um, and, and we went to that parade. I don't remember them saying this, but apparently they did. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. That kind of hateful talk. That's what they used to do back then. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, but now... Now it's all of the, all of those, everybody dreaming. Now the, but the change is bigger than you think, right? This ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what's that about? Well, you know, there's a sexual revolution on and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, as, you, as, as believers, we should realize, eh, well, you know, there's things... There's forces behind, you know, the, uh, the sexual revolution. Well, yeah, I know, no, no real rich guys that meet. No, no, we're not talking about that. Not, not some uh, one conspiracy theory or another, but simply divine revelation, right? There's the prince of the power of the air who's now working in the sons of disobedience. That's what's behind trends that you see. And so a move like that, what, that, that's a direct assault on the kind of thing, you know, that Jesus would have taught. So God created them in his own image, in the image of God. He created them male and male, male and female. He created them. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That's the way it is. That's the word of God on the subject. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. If there's word of God in the world, which Jesus assumes there is, which the disciples of Jesus assume there is, that's it. That's it. That's how it is. And that's what the people of God announce and stand on. And that's the sort of message that Jesus went and spread I don't care what anybody else thinks. This is what God says. And to come full circle to where we started, and, and that's why you could be killed for putting a Bible in Somalia. Or in North Korea. The notion that there's an authority in the world higher than any government authority. There just is. Doesn't matter what a government's authority say. There just is. There's a divine authority in the world. And Jesus announces it. And he leads us as his followers to embrace it and live by it and announce it. And so back to Jesus' great 
priorities. Uh, he prioritizes prayer. He does not prioritize popularity at all. But he does prioritize the proclamation of the word of God, formally, informally. Those are among the priorities of Jesus that should be reflected in the lives of his disciples. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to know the priorities of the Lord Jesus, your priorities. And I ask that as we know them, that we would build them into our lives so as to reflect them, so as to love them, so as to be shaped by them, so as to stand in behalf of them. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.